amazing. I think that is not only appropriate, it is a continual reminder for us that as we look to him, we look in awe of who God is. We look in amazement because there is no one else. We can not compare him and his character. If, as you start to compare, you find someone like God, you either have the wrong God or you have a too low of a view of God because there is none like him. If you are truly looking at the God of the scriptures, you stand and say, you stand alone. There is none that compares. And this morning as we look at our message that's uh, centered around or focused on our fathers or on even men in general. We look at the perfect standard. We look at perfection. We look with amazement toward him who gives us what it should be like all the time. Not so that we hang our heads in disappointment saying, I'll never meet that standard but we live our lives always being transformed more and more and more into that standard, knowing that the day we have become perfect before God is the day that we are physically standing in front of God. See, the deal becomes I don't get disappointed when I see the perfect standard, when I see the perfection of the Lord. I don't get disappointed. I get determined. And that determination is I want my life to look more and more and more like him, knowing that he is not standing there with the proverbial Louisville slugger waiting to swing away if I don't get it right. But what he's doing is his loving hands are reaching out and they are telling me, you can keep growing, son. You can keep looking more and more like me as you look more and more like the son. And so this morning, as we look at what I'm going to title Dads of Distinction or even Men of Distinction, I want us to remember that the perfect standard stands there. I'm not looking at my brothers uh, to be the example um, of perfection. I'm looking at them to encourage me for sure. But I'm looking to my father for that. Had a chance this morning to text. I'll get a chance to call later. My father, I have the have the privilege of having him still in my life. And, um, and I wrote him, and he responded back. I was surprised. He's, he, he, he's more phone savvy. He uses more of the emojis and everything else on his phone. And I was like, you have someone writing that for you, Dad? But he responded back, and love you, son, and you're a good father. And, and, and that just encouraged me. You know, to be able to have that from a man that I know was walking with the Lord. And I know everyone doesn't have that, and yet your fathers encourage you, saying, keep going. I love you. And then he is saying that I'm with you, and I'm turning you into who I want you to be. Turn with me to Psalm 112. It has been said that if there is an equivalent to the Proverbs 31 woman, it is the Psalm 112 man. As we look at that, and we look at this, and we look through in, 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 in gratitude for God given a standard. Now, this can be said of anyone, not just men, but today we will look at it specifically in relation to our men. I'm going to ask you to stand as we read God's word responsively. Actually, let's read it together, everyone. And if you look in your bulletins, you have the text in the ESV that we can all read together. If you don't have a bulletin, raise your hand. Get, let an usher be able to get you one. You can read with us. Hey, have some hands up over here, please, ushers, so you can get him a, get him a bulletin. I'll wait for just a moment. All right, let's all read together. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord 
who greatly delights in his commandments. His offspring will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. Light dawns in the darkness for the upright. He is gracious, merciful, and righteous. It is well with the man who deals generously and lends, who conducts his affairs with justice. For the righteous will never be moved. He will be remembered forever. He is not afraid of bad news. His heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. His heart is steady. He will not be afraid until he looks in triumph over his adversaries. He has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn is exalted in honor. The wicked man sees it and is angry. He gnashes his teeth and melts away. The desire of the wicked will perish. Amen. You may be seated. One of the things to remember with this is as you read it, I would encourage you to go back home today. You don't fully appreciate the 112th Psalm until you have read the 111th Psalm because they are actually paired together. When you look at them both, because they are both these psalms, so they are song-like, they are both written in what is called an acrostic. And an acrostic is, for each stanza, it starts with, for each line, it it actually starts with with a different letter in order of the Hebrew alphabet. So they both have 22 lines, both of them. And as you look at them, they almost mirror one another. The 111th Psalms is talking about the character and the greatness of God himself. And he's talking about the Father. And then the 112th Psalm comes along and it talks about the man whose father is the 111th Psalm. And so you see an example and a picture of the Father in all his perfection And then you see a picture of the son of the father. And for us, we are seeing how we are constantly being transformed. But again, I'm going to give you the hope in the beginning, because when you look to accomplishing 112th Psalm, the perfection of the son of the father is the son of the father. Jesus Christ stands perfectly as the son who lives all of that out. And so as we look today, the 111th Psalm, as a matter of fact, there are different lines. As you, as you line them up, what you will see is when it talks about God is gracious and merciful, in that same stanza in the 112th Psalm, it talks about the godly man is gracious and merciful. Why? Because he is emulating his father. And so as you read them both, we're not going to read them both. We don't have the time. But as you make time for yourself this week, read the 111 Psalms, and you'll get a picture of where the 112th Psalm man gets it from. I, you know, I have, the, the, the older I get, the more my siblings tell me, you act just like dad. Now, I don't know if sometimes that's in frustration or if that is sometimes a compliment, I think it's both. Because I act like him, we are the same height, we have the same build. It's interesting that he waited to name his third son somewhat after them. For many of you that know, the J in J. Curtis stands for John. And my father's name is John as well, and his father and his father. And so he waited until his third son to name him John. And that third son looks a lot like him. I find that interesting. Height and everything. I could wear his clothes. You know, and, and so it is, it is funny today that as we talk and as I hear people say about it, they say, you act like dad. And now I respond, whether they mean it good or not, I say, thank you. Because if it's bad, let me frustrate you like dad did. <laughs> but this just gives me the picture for ourselves of how we are to emulate our Father, and how we're to look like Him. And I'm going to do four things for us this morning that I want us to look at. I want us to look at 
the relationship that this man, this dad of distinction, this man of distinction has with the perfect father, which is God himself. So the relationship that he has with God, the relationship that he has with his possessions, the relationship that he has with the world around him, and then the relationship he has with the ungodly, with the wicked. I want us to look at that because he takes us down that journey and the effects of them all. And so we start off, and I like that, he starts off, as a matter of fact, the 111th Psalms last verse is an introduction to the 112th Psalms first verse. Read it with me. If you look at the 111th Psalm, verse 10, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. And then he takes up on this new song and he says, this is Psalm and says, praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandments. Let me give you just an example of just how this works. And so when he looks at it, he says, I'm finishing up this Psalm where I'm talking about God saying, the man who has it together will fear this kind of God. And when he says fear, he doesn't, he is not mainly meaning this, this whole act of terror, although we're not going to totally dismiss this whole thing of terror before the Lord, because we know the descriptors of God in scripture talks about him being a consuming fire, him being awesome, him being mighty. And so he is one not to be taken lightly. We don't stand before him in terror and fear, thinking that he's going to do something evil to us as we are his children. But we do not take him lightly. The weightiness of who God is should be recognized, that we should have that respect for him. We do it in everyday life. When we look at our military, for instance, if a private is standing in the room and a five-star general walks in, the countenance changes. Now, even though they are both human and they are both men or man and woman, they are both human, what ends up happening is the rank, the status, the position of the five-star causes a certain response in the private or anyone else under the five stars. And if we can do that for those who put on their pants the same way and jackets the same way and have to clean him or herself up the same way as we do, if we can give that level of respect because of a rank and a position, how much more can we do it for the one who is truly different from us? Although we were made in his image, we are not him. Although we reflect the image of God, we are not him. And so he says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And then the 112th Psalm shows us what the wise life, the person who fears the Lord looks like. And then it starts off, he has a relationship with God that is first. It says, the fear of of this said, blessed is the man who fears the Lord. Why? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You are just getting in the door when you begin to fear God. He says, you're not totally wise to fear. In other words, because you hold God as weighty in your life, because you don't take him lightly, what he says and does means a lot to you. And so blessed is the man who has a weightiness in his mind for who God is because it governs your choices. There are some things I won't do because of how high God is, how heavy he is in my life. There are some things that I say no to. There are some things that I stand for. There are some places I don't go. There are some things I don't say because of the weightiness of God in my life. And when I do those things, I don't sit and wallow in them. I allow myself to come out of it knowing that that God who I am to fear also makes it possible that I can be forgiven. And I come and I make it right. So this person, 
his relationship with God. He has one and it's growing. Now, let me just interject. This does not mean that this person doesn't trip doesn't fall, that sometimes they get into a rut where they should not be. God says, but he has his heart. This person will come back to what's right. If you mess up, you don't stay and mess up long. You don't stay down long. You don't stay unforgiven long. You make it right because God is important to you. That's the first thing. And I, because everything, everything else comes from that first point. It starts of blesses the man who fears the Lord. Your relationship with God or lack of it will determine everything else in your life. And so he looks at it here and he says he has a relationship. But looks what hap- look, look at what happens because of that relationship. He says, first of all, he says, blesses the man who fears the Lord. What does it look like? who greatly delights in his commandments. God's word is not a burden to you. You're like, oh, man, I got to do this thing. God, man, I don't want to do this. Yeah, you had to say that in your word. I was really trying to, trying to have a good time. Lord, you done messed it up. <laughs> Saying that in your word. God's commandments are not burdensome to the one who fears the Lord. Oh, you may not want to do it. There have been times, that I, 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 Lord, I really don't. I need to apologize. I, Lord, I really don't. I need to go back and say, I, Lord, I really, but I will. Why, Father? Because you are weighty to me. And so I do those things, but they're not. He says he delights in his commandments. Where are his commandments? In his word. But look at the results of that. Where it is seen is in his children. He said, his offspring will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. And what he is saying is that because you are living genuinely for the Lord, it will be seen by your children. It doesn't mean that all your children will flawlessly walk through this life. He's not saying that at all. What he's saying is that they have an example of what it looks like to live godly, and they will. They will most likely follow your footsteps. You know, children tend to follow the footsteps of parents in some way or another. They may not have the same career. They may not have the same likes in certain areas, but there are some things that they pattern after you. And we start to see it the older we get, the things that we've learned. And some of those things we've had to unlearn. But the things that we've learned and and we see that we've gotten it from a parent, we've gotten it from a dad. And we go, hmm, thank you, or we say, no, thank you. And I'm hoping that the thank yous are a whole lot more than the no thank yous. But just in case your no thank yous are more than your thank yous for your dad, God says, look to me, and you'll always say thank you. The next is his relationship with his possessions. I want to make known that right now, especially as brothers, especially as men, look at the order between his relationship with God and his relationship with his possessions. They are in the right order. Because for many of us, we take our relationships with our possessions and they become God. And God says, you got it in the right order. Thus, all the rest of your life and your relationships will be out of order. He says he has that right place. God has that right place in his life. And thus possessions can be a part of that life. Possessions should be a part of that life. But you have the right way to handle it. One of the things I remember when I was getting ready to come on staff with with Now Call Crew, back at that time, Campus Crusade for Christ, it is an organization where you raise support like missionaries who, goes, who, who, who may go overseas. Here, they, they raise support. They get people to partner with them, and that is what funds their life, their ministry, all of what they do. They raise support, and people come and support them, and so I had to do that. And so when I told my dad you know, first that, that, that I had gotten this job with this Christian organization and that I was going to be going away to training for eight weeks and then I was going to come back. I was going to be working with them in the city. He was excited for me, but just like a dad, his first question was, 
Are they paying you? <laughs> Was he not concerned about the godliness of the organization? No, no, he knew about the organization because it heard me talk about them. Uh, but he was making sure two things. I could be self-supported. I wasn't coming back to live in his house. <laughs> he said, are they paying you? I said, Dad, they are. And I had to explain the whole thing to him. But the deal was he had the right thought about possessions. He wanted to make sure that I could stand on my own, that I was not living off of someone that I was doing what was right and I needed to, and that I could later even support a family. And those are not wrong. Those are very godly things, but it becomes ungodly when they're out of order. And when they come before God, and for many brothers today, our toys, our lifestyles, our possessions have occupied the place of God. Here's how you find it. What do you find you spend most of your time thinking or worrying about? I'm not saying that that's, that, that means that they're out of order, but, but the thing where you spend the, or the things you spend the most time on, the places where your mind goes the most, the things that you worry about the most are the things that are occupying who you are. And my question becomes, what is that? Are you concerned about how you are living before God, it will occupy your time. It will cause you to sit and have some devotional time so that you know what the Lord expects and who you are in the Lord. If I don't, what that's telling me is that I really don't think that that's that important. But I'm spending lots of time at work because I got to, and I, hey, I got to earn that cash, Lord. I got to make that money, Lord. And you may have to. But if you do it without God, he says, everything is messed up. Everything that follows, mm -mm. it's going to be out of line. So his relationship with, his, with the father, the relationship with his possessions, and look how that helps him. It says in, in, in verse 3, it says, wealth and riches are in this house. And that, doesn't mean, that does not mean that every believer will have wealth and riches. First of all, what is that? Wealth, if you are in a third world country, wealth might be your weekly salary, might be their yearly salary. That could be wealth. But it says wealth and riches, and it speaks about the quality of your life. You will have what you need, and you may even have an abundance, but here's the deal. God is not promising that every follower of his will be rich. Because as you look at other, uh, other scriptures, he doesn't point to that. And as you see other examples in scripture, but what God is saying is that in that in general, that person who has his priorities right will have a lot of life taken care of. And even if they struggle, we see that down here, there are some things that he, that, that he allows God to handle. The point is where his trust is, is in God because he placed them in the first position. So we go down and he says, verse 4, light dawns in the darkness for the upright. He is gracious, merciful, and righteous. Now understand, here is a person who was, person who was wealthy and is rich. But it says that his righteousness endures forever. That's interesting because he is not beside himself because he's wealthy. He's not one of those folks that are hard to live with because he has some cash. He's not one of those people that his possessions and his toys, he keeps telling everyone about. And so you hear about nothing else but what he has. God says when you look at this person, because his priorities are right, he is gracious, he is merciful, and he is righteous, although wealthy. It says, it is, verse 5, it is well with the man who deals generously in lens and, and who conducts his affairs with justice. It has been known throughout history that sometimes um, some of the most unmerciful, sometimes some of the most unjust are our wealthy. We have allowed that wealth to get to us that we think we are better than the rest. But when you look here, you see a man who God has tempered his heart. And so that even though he may have and he may have possessions, what you don't see is a man who is disconnected from society and for those in need. He uses what he's been giving 
to given to help those who have needs while they're living. And he doesn't have a problem with it. His lifestyle, he is one who is gracious. Because if you look at the 111th Psalm and you read that same verse, you will see that the father is gracious. And so he's learned from dad. And then you go here and you see later down how he continues to give. But he says here that he is one who is generous and lends. I know sometimes the stereotype of the wealthy is that they are stingy. There are some that aren't, and we know that. But God says, because the money doesn't have him and he has the money and the possessions, he has no issue giving it. So it's the relationship with his possessions. And because of that, look at what happens. Many times when you deal with those who have a lot, the legacy they leave or the status that they have, they are working hard to keep. And when when your priorities are out of whack and possessions is in the first position, you are fighting hard to keep it and your status. But when they're not, look at what happens. It says... For the righteous, verse 6, will never be moved. He will be remembered forever. You want status? You want legacy? You want folk to remember you? It's not just having your name on the building somewhere. It's not having your name um, honored up somewhere. What it's saying is because of who you are, because of your righteous living, you will be remembered and your place will not be removed. It's hard to remove a righteous man. It's hard to replace a righteous man. You don't have to worry about your status. You don't have to worry about how people will view you. You keep living right, and God says they'll have no choice but remember who you are. People don't recognize you. God says keep living right. One day they will because you will stand up against most of the other people at that time who are living for themselves. And God says, you will stand out among them as righteous because you lived for me. And so now we go on. Not only is his relationship with his possessions, it's his relationship with the world around him. Verse 7, he is not afraid of bad news. His heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. Can I stop there for a second? That verse 7, when it says his heart is firm, trusting in the Lord, and take it back, his trust is not in his wealth nor his riches, although he has them. And because bad news comes, and or because he may get some news like Job did where he lost everything, where he lost all of his business, he lost all of his possessions, Job even lost his family, his kids. And he makes the comment and says, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He said, I have received from the Lord and the Lord has allowed it to be snatched. God, I'm mad at you. No, he didn't say that. He said, blessed be the name of the Lord. Why? Because he realized it was not the things that he had, but he was the God who had given him the things that he had. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And in case we thought Job was wrong, he was crazy, the scripture underneath that says, and God did not charge him with sin in anything. In anything that he said, Job did not sin. That included the verse before where he said, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. He didn't sin by saying that. He was right. And so he says here, he's not afraid of bad news. Now, he didn't say he didn't plan for bad news. Some of us go around, well, I'm just going to trust the Lord. I'm going to live like I want. I'm going to trust the Lord. Nah, brother. You better be saving some money. You better have an emergency plan. You better be looking at a budget. He says that, He is not afraid of bad news. Why? Because he's been living as he should. And even if he's not, he knows how he can get on board. So he says he's not afraid of bad news. As some of us, I don't want to hear bad news. No one wants to. But he said, I'm not afraid of it. Why? Because his heart is firm. He is standing in a firm place. Why? Because he's not trusting in what he has. He is trusting in the Lord. 
Who are you trusting in? What are you trusting in? If it changed today, if you left here and got bad news, what would happen? God says the bad news doesn't affect him because he, just like every other human on the planet, will get good news and will get bad news. Just because you're a believer doesn't mean it's going to fall on good news all the time for you. Nope. You're going to have some bad too. The difference between you and the unbeliever is what are you trusting in and who are you trusting in? That's going to be the difference. So his relationship with the world around him, look, we're going to stay on that thought. The relationship with the world around him, he said, verse 8, his heart is steady. He will not be afraid until he looks in triumph on his adversaries. And stop there for a second. What he's saying now is not only is he not afraid of bad news as it may affect him, his possessions, his family, he is not afraid of those who oppose him. He said his heart is steady. I like that. His heart is steady. We used to say when I was growing up, there's no fear in my heart. You come and get someone that was bigger. He said, yo, it don't make a difference. Yo, man, you know, I, there's no fear in my heart. And what you're telling the person, I'm not afraid of you. It doesn't make a difference. Even if you beat me, I'm not afraid of you. It makes all the difference in the world. That that person knows that they're coming up against someone who is ready for the opposition. He says his heart is firm and he says, until, he said, he is standing steady until his adversaries are overcome, whatever those adversaries or whomever those adversaries are. He's not giving up in the face of opposition. He's not giving up because somebody's coming against him. He's not giving up because people are, are coming against him because he is living right. Because let me tell you, when you choose to live right, everyone doesn't line up saying, so glad you chose to live right. We're going to try and do everything in our power to help you out because you chose to live right today. As a matter of fact, there'll be some people that look at you and say, yeah, okay, we'll see how that works out. And they're just waiting for you to fall so they can say, see, I told you. Man, see, I told you. You're going to mess up. And the person who, the man who is following the Lord, the dad of distinction says, hey, I might have messed up, but it's not over. Oh, you got it wrong, buddy. Because the God I trusted and I'm going right back to him jumping right back on the saddle, and we're going back at it. And he says, until my adversaries are overcome, I'm pushing, I'm, you know, I'm going at it. It reminds me of that person that is constantly trying to learn a new skill or, or an athlete that's trying to learn or trying to improve a new skill, and they go at it regardless of how much they mess up and how much work it takes and how much time has to be spent. They're like not quitting. And if we can do that in the gym, if we can do that at work, we can do it in life. But I also like his heart. He says here that he, verse 9, he has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. See, the first one, he generously lends, and that is those that are close to him and around him. When it says he gives to the poor, it's talking about now his society, his community. And here is a man who is in touch with his community around him and does something about it. And it said he's, he distributes freely. Now, here's what he didn't say. It didn't say he distributes carelessly because there is a strategy and a plan to it. He said he distributes freely. He knows how to spend. He knows how to give. He knows when to hold back. He knows how to let others around them sense and feel the blessings that he has been giving. He distributes freely. He doesn't put any strings attached to it. You know I gave to you the last time, man. And, but even if he doesn't give, he's instructing as he is helping others. So he says he gives to the poor, and again, his righteousness endures forever. If you look at the 111th Psalm, that's what it says of the Lord. But why does it say that of this man? Because this man is following the Lord. He is living in the character of the Lord, and thus the righteousness of the Lord is on him, and it endures. And then lastly, his relationship with the wicked. Wow, his relationship with the wicked. The only thing you see 
his relationship in this case is that he is living in such a position and place that they see him. He's not living in isolation. The wicked see how he is living. The ungodly sees his life, and there are some that will be haters. He says he sees it, and they are angry. I told you they're not lining up to help you out because you chose to live right. He said, they see how you are being blessed, and it makes them mad. When it talks about someone gnashing their teeth, that's gritting their teeth, how is this, this, oh, holier than now, this Mr. Goody Two Shoes, this Mr. Righty Right is doing so well? Man, I hate that dude. And God says, that's okay. He says, because... Because they've chose not to follow God, they are standing on the outside looking and mad at you because life is right. It didn't say life was perfect. It didn't say life was easy. It didn't say life was without the issues and the problems. They see how you're handling it, and they go, I wish I could be like that. And you go, it's easy. Choose to follow the God, I'm fine. I don't want to do that. Well, then you don't want to have a life like mine then. God says anyone can have a life like this because anyone can choose to follow God. The dad of distinction, the man of distinction, has his priorities right, so his relationship with God is first and it is intimate. Then his relationship with his possessions is that he realizes that they come from God and that they're not just for him but for those around him helping to establish a godly legacy that will last Thirdly, he says his relationship with the world around him is that he sees the needs, is that he doesn't have an issue with bad news because he knows he lives in a sinful environment. He is trusting in the Lord, not his wealth nor his position, so it can come or go. And then lastly, his relationship with the wicked, it says, listen, I know that they are looking from the outside in, and some of them don't like it and wish me harm. You know, he doesn't wish them harm back. He keeps living for God. Why? Because he realizes that in him I will not be moved. I will not be taken from my position. I will have the status that I really desire. I will have the status that God wants to give me. See, the dad of distinction is someone who is constantly growing. You may say today, wow, I'm, I'm, I'm not like that, nor can I be like that. Yeah, you can in increasing measure. Here's the other thing that it tells you, though. What it tells you is it gives you kind of a reflection of how you appear and how you look. What do I mean by that? Think about this for a second. You know, uh, There are certain tendencies. There are features, there are actions that we have of our dads or of our parents or, 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 or of people that have stepped in to be dads in our lives. If we've been around them long enough, there are certain traits that we've picked up in life. The things that you do, ways that you sit, things that you say, your buying choices, the, the things you tend to like. People look at that and say, man, you are doing that just like your. And my deal becomes, what are we, if, if, if we have seen and look in our own lives and we fall short, the hope is God says that can change because the perfect standard for humanity on earth is Jesus. And Jesus looked like his father. He was so much like God that he said, if you see me, you see the Father. Sometimes if you see me and how I act, you'll see John C. Coston Jr., who's my dad. And if you looked at him, and we did, and we saw some of his actions, he acted just like John C. Coston Sr., his dad. And I will ask you today, are you looking like your father? Oh, I'm not talking about your earthly one. Because I know you are doing some things that he may do or those father figures in your life. But I want to ask you, do you look like your heavenly father? 
if there aren't any traits of his that are evident in your life, you might not be a son of his. Do you look like the father in any way at all? Do you act and live like the father in any way at all? Do you desire to be like the father in any way at all? That's for all of us. God says, my children hear my voice. Well, of course, because they know my voice. They respond to it. I know my kids can pick out my voice. And well, first, because they say that I talk loud. But they can pick out my voice anywhere, I'm sure. I could do that with my dad. There can be a crowd of people, and I hear his voice. I could pick it out because I've heard it many times. Well, how do I hear the voice of the Lord? It's his word. And it's the character that comes from knowing who God is. As I read his word, I know his character. And so when I see something, I go, that's not God. Somebody can say that's God, but that's not God. Oh, I'll say, that's God. How do I know? Because I'm like my father. Perfectly? Oh, no. No. Increasingly, I pray that I am. And I pray that you as well, Dad, this morning... We don't have to leave here saying, I'm not like that. We can leave here saying, I want to be like that. And God is saying, because of Christ who came and who died and who made it possible that we can, he says, the power to be a dad of distinction is yours. It is at your disposal if you would but put me first. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much, Father, for your love for us, for being that perfect Father, for letting us see how being the perfect dad gave us the example for how us as men, Lord, how we should live. Father, I thank you, Lord, that we can be a dad of distinction because we pursue and follow you. God, I pray that our priorities are right, that it is our relationship with you first, our relationship and, and, and thus, it helps the relationship with our families. Then it's our relationship with our possessions, Father. And then it's our relationship with the world around us. And because we have your heart, we deal with the world around us according to your heart. And then it's our relationship with the world we serve as a model that sometimes they don't like. Father, I pray that we would follow you hard we would follow you firmly. Father, that as it says in the psalm, that we are not afraid of bad news, that our hearts are firm, trusting in the Lord. Father, I pray that that would be our hope, that would be our desire as men, as fathers today. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. I'm just going to ask you to keep your Head bowed and eyes closed for just a moment. We'll be out of here in just a few moments. And just one today, a couple of things. One is if you've heard this message today and you are saying, man, I, I'm not that. I've looked at these qualities of God and I don't see any. I don't know that I know God. I don't know that I'm one of his sons or daughters. And you want to change that today. I would love to meet with you today. I would love for you to be able to come up and talk to me afterwards. I'm going to stay up here today and, um, and come up and, and, and talk to me, ask me if I would pray for you. The second thing is if today, yes, you are one of God's children. Yes, you have trusted Christ as your Savior. Yes, you have asked Him to forgive you of your sins. And thus now you stand as one of His clean, but you go, wow, I really need help being this kind of dad, being this kind of man. And you just want me to pray for you. I'm not going to call you up just right where you are. Just raise your hand. I would love to pray for you this morning. You just want prayer. I want to be a dad a man of distinction. Can you just raise your hand? I'd love to pray for you. Father, I thank you that we can indeed be 
dads of distinction. I pray that, Lord, you would allow us to dial into who you are, standing firm, trusting in the Lord. I ask you this in Christ's name.